What is going on, dudes and dudettes? It is Devil here, bringing you back some more uh, horror content, I guess. Uh, I kind of recently started doing that. And today we got The Melancholy of Herbert Solomon. Creepypasta by Michael Whitehouse, performed by Otis Geary. This was a recommendation by Brandon Lazelle, who also recommended uh, The Quiet Sky Creepypasta reading. And uh, that shit was pretty creepy, not gonna lie. I really like that one because of its take on an alien invasion and how different it was. So the melancholy of Herbert Solomon, I have no idea, but I'm ready. I got this. I promise I won't get scared. Is that the video I did where I did it in the dark? I look like the 2012 YouTuber. Well, let me check. Oh my God. Oh, there it is. Go in the middle. Yes, it is. Oh my God. The camera quality is so crap. I don't know what it is about having lights on that makes like everything look so crisp. And then as soon as you turn them off, you look shit. But here, we're going to turn them off. Oh, wait. No, not that. This. There we go. I'm doing that uh, later. <laughs> I had these all the way off, didn't I? Oh my god, this is gonna be horrible. Jesus Christ. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. Chilling tales for dark nights. Does this thing have images? Oh gosh. On several occasions, my interest in the supernatural has taken me to some of the most prestigious seats of learning in the entire United Kingdom, from the venerable halls of Oxford and Cambridge to the more humble surroundings of inner-city colleges and schools. My pursuit of evidence to substantiate such claims has rarely been fruitful. However, while exploring the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, I found a rather interesting tome hidden away in a dark and musty corner of the campus library. The book itself was unusual, its cover bound in a weathered and blackened leather which, unashamedly, wore the wrinkles and cracks of time. It dated back to the 16th century and seemed to contain various descriptions and accounts of the daily lives of the people of Ettrick. Not gonna lie being stuck in a library like after hours or something like just while it's closed is so terrifying to me like i don't you know I, there's those challenges people do where they like go into a walmart i know somebody just got arrested for doing that shit <laughs> but like like going into walmart to targets or whatever the hell and like trying to stay the night i'd rather do that than a library i don't know what it is i think it's the environment and how quiet it is you know like libraries are always so quiet you know Walmart is always so bustling, you know, a lot of a lot of noise and stuff. Just the the eeriness of a library. I just couldn't do it. I'd go insane, man. A small, isolated town built in the South Moorlands of the country. But using the volume, there were a variety of entries from a number of authors spanning a 60-year period. It seemed to have been handed down from town elder to town elder over that time. And to be quite frank, most of it contained idle musings on the townsfolk and plans for a number of humble building projects and improvements. Just as I was about to conclude that the book was of little interest to me, I noticed on the inside of the back cover that someone had drawn a picture. It was elegantly depicted, but I would never have described it as a pleasing sight. In fact, my immediate reaction was one of disgust upon first viewing it. It was a dick, wasn't it? The combination of the harsh, almost angry black lines used and the stark imagery of the scene, as relayed by the artist, left me with a thoroughly unpleasant impression of its subject. I shuddered as I cast my eye over it in an attempt to take in the picture of what seemed to be of a tall man with long, thin arms and legs. Slender man? His face was... Partially obscured by one of his gaunt white hands, but what could be seen was monstrous. Fuck Prominent that. veins protruded from his forehead, leading up to a pallid bald head. His eyes were deep set into his skull, and the surrounding woods seemed to twist and lean away from him fearfully. At first, I assumed that the picture was some form of hideous graffiti, but at the bottom of the page was inscribed the date. 1578, 
and a rather unusual yeah. name, Herbert Solomon. Whether this was the name of the menacing figure in the drawing or of the artist, I do not know. On closer inspection, what surprised me further was that the same image seemed to recur elsewhere in the book, but drawn by apparently different individuals. Oh, hell no. Within the book, I found numerous mentions of Herbert Solomon, and it became clear quickly that he was indeed the emaciated man in the picture. He had lived in the 16th century on the outskirts of Ettrick Town. It was a small and underdeveloped place, surrounded on all sides by the thick cover of Ettrick Forest, which itself sat in the midst of a vast region of southern moorland. According to the descriptions in the book, during the December of 1577, children began to disappear from the town. The first was a young girl by the name of Alana Sutherland. She had been playing with... I feel like it's too obvious to say it was Herbert Solomon. And it, it says the melancholy of Herbert Solomon. Like, I feel like that's just, like, a red herring. There's going to be something else here. Like, yeah, there's children missing, but maybe he gets blamed for it, and then it turns out it wasn't him. But he got punished anyways. Like, he's already dead, so... What can you do now, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> but so far... Not, not scared yet, but you know, we're just getting started, so who knows? Maybe it's going to start building up the story, you know, make me poop my pants. Let's Some see. friends by an old well on the outskirts of town that had dropped a small toy down it accidentally, which had caused her much distress. Unable to retrieve it, she returned home to borrow some string and an old hook in the hopes of being able to fish the doll out of the water below. She was last seen walking towards the well just as the sun set. In a panic, the townsfolk searched. They dredged the well, they combed the wheat fields, and even sent several groups of those willing into the surrounding woods. Alas, the girl was not found. A few days later, a young boy by the name of Eric Kennedy was running an errand for his grandmother. It was dark but he had only to take some wool over to the Monroe place as a way of thanks for the grain they had provided. It sounds like some little red riding shit. But only a few streets away. It was assumed that at least the center of town would be safe. But the boy never completed his errand. He vanished as if he were torn from existence. Damn, SCP? By the end of January, an unusually bitter winter had caused significant damage to the town and its people. Large, thick sheets of ice and snow covered each house and building. Several people died from the cold alone, and the general mood of Ettrick Town was a somber one. Despite these trying times, the townspeople were more concerned with the safety of their offspring. In total, seven children had now disappeared without rhyme or reason. Whole families wept in despair, and the people of Ettrick began to view one another suspiciously. They oh. knew Someone was taking their children from them. Dude, is this like a similar story to that town in Unsolved, not Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, crap. What is it? Uh, was it Unsolved Mysteries? The, the X-Files? Yeah, so I just looked it up and the show I was actually talking about is The Twilight Zone. And the specific episode is the Monsters Are Due at Maple Street episode. Uh, I remember the, watching this for class, but yeah, this is what I'm describing, this episode of The Twilight Zone. Maybe Pete learned something and came back to tell us who it was amongst us we had to look out for. No! No, it's nothing of the sort! Ah, uh, one of those shows, old shows that, like, there was a neighborhood, and I forgot what it was, but they just turned on each other, and then... Like, it turns out, I don't know, like, aliens were invading or something, but, like, they just got the people to turn on themselves, and then, you know, it just ended up being a neighborhood of people arguing and, you know, turning on each other. This sounds like that's where it's heading. Like, the kids are missing, and the neighbors are just going to turn on each other until, like, something bad happens, and then, I don't know, Herbert Solomon is probably, like, the only one left, the only one who survived this ordeal. By mid-February, two more had went missing, 
and accusatory glances were now being shared between every family and mm-hmm. every member of the community. The town elder decided to act and took it upon himself, the arduous task, of identifying and catching the fiend. Bureaucratic discussions were had, church groups convened, and in every house, in every street, in every corner of Ettrick, one name crossed the lips of its inhabitants. Oh, no, Herbert. Solomon. The more the name was mentioned, the more certain his guilt became. Herbert Solomon was an outsider. He lived in a small wooden cabin amongst the woods, which surrounded the town, and due to his unfortunate appearance, tended to avoid human contact. What his malady was, no one was sure, and in the unenlightened times of 16th century Scotland, many believed that he was cursed. That's Modern messed up. eyes would have guessed him to be a victim of a wasting disease. He rarely ventured into town, except on a few occasions to trade for supplies, and even in those instances he covered his face with a brown tarnished hat and a gray piece of cloth, which obscured his features below two deep-set and darkened eyes. Several of the townsfolk told stories of Herbert Solomon. According to these accounts, he would stand on the edge of the forest watching the farmers till their land and their children play in the fields. It was his fascination with children which left many feeling uneasy. Yeah, that is a bit sus, man. Some of the town's children returned home from playing near the woods on a number of occasions, with beautifully crafted dolls and toys. They were a present from Herbert Solomon, and being innocent children, they could not know of the dangers therein. So when the children him? began to disappear, eyes immediately turned to the strange man living in the woods. Accusations were carried by the whispers of fearful parents, and as the whispers increased in number, so did their volume, until it was decided that Herbert Solomon had to be stopped. Mm. On a cold February night, the elders of the town decreed that Solomon should be arrested immediately. Grief, anger, resentment, and fear grew to a fever pitch with this news, and every man, woman, and child set out across the fields, entering into the surrounding forest in search of the child killer, Herbert Solomon. Details of exactly what occurred that night are limited, but it seems as though the people of Ettrick Town attempted to remove Herbert from his small cabin by setting it on fire. The Jeez. crowds cheered as the heat grew and the fire rose. His screams echoed throughout the woods until, at last, they were silenced by the flames. See, I couldn't live in this time. Like, Well, first of all, I'm already a minority, so I'm already not going to be getting treated fairly. Oh, so the only nigga I gotta beat today is... Angel. Ah. But, like... People, there is no, like, judicial system, you know? Like, yeah, Herbert, I I also think he's a bit sus, but I don't think, like, the best course of action is to go set his house on fire, just, boom, judge, jury, and executioner. Because, like, what evidence do they have other than he gives dolls to kids? You know, like, like, I admit they're, like, yeah that's worth an investigation like go into his house search it but like i get it it's the 1600s but like if this happened today i'd be like man something needs to be done about this like the right way like an investigation you know look hey these children are missing is there any evidence that they were here you know uh do you know anything about this what's up with you giving dolls to kids man that's kind of weird you know i get it like you're just trying to be nice but like I don't know. If I had a kid and somebody gave him a doll, like a random old man up the street gave him a doll, uh, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Like, maybe they're nice, but also maybe they're, you know, freaking Herbert the pervert from Family Guy. You know, you never know in today's age. I feel like you can't really be too trusting in today's age, you know? Like, you never know what some of these intentions can be. But, like, just because you don't know doesn't mean you should burn them alive (laughs) you know (laughs) like relax there should be steps taken before you go to you know arson the townsfolk believed that justice had been done and while the grief of the parents whom had lost their children could never be quenched there was at least the satisfaction of knowing that the man responsible was now dead but was he however Over the following few days, 
and unease descended upon the entire town. Did more keep disappearing? Stories began to spread of strange encounters in the streets at night of a gaunt, shadowy figure prowling the cobbled stones hiding oh, in the darkness. No. Within a week, numerous residents claimed to have woken up during the night to the petrifying sight of an unwelcomed visitor. One account was of an elderly lady who woke to the sound of something rustling under her bed, only to nearly die of shock as a tall, Jeez. thin man pulled himself out from underneath. She Hell fainted, not. but not before she saw his face. I would have almost died of shock, too. Fuck being elderly. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. That's another fear of mine, man. Like, just... Not just... I'm not afraid of the dark, but I'm afraid of dark places. Like, my closet. I can't have it open when I'm asleep, because, like, I'm afraid something's going to come out of there. <laughs> you know, I'm weird like that. And, like, same with, like, looking in your blanket. It's like, dude, no. And if, like, you you ever see something come out of that, like, oh, fuck, man. I, I feel her. I feel her pain. A complexion withered as if ravaged by disease his eyes blacker than night, and his hand comprised a tightly pulled skin over a bony interior. Another story consisted of a local tradesman who, while investigating a noise from his cellar, was confronted by a hideous figure so tall and gaunt that it had to hunch over to avoid the low ceiling entirely, its sheet-white face flickering in the candlelight. The man managed to escape, but he refused to re-enter his premises. Yeah, I wouldn't either. It became clear to the town Hell no. that the vengeful ghost of Herbert Solomon was still searching for other victims from beyond the grave, his hate and hideous form haunting the town which murdered him. With each passing day, the sightings grew in intensity and in number. A fog descended on the town, and the people wept and grieved as the sound of Herbert Solomon terrorized each person, night Damn. by night. He was seen wandering amongst the wheat fields, as well as in the cellars and lofts of cottage houses, his long, gaping footsteps ringing out each night through the streets of Ettrick Terrace. I'd move across the country. They had been cursed. To a new country, in life, shit. Herbert Solomon had taken and murdered their children, and now in death he seemed to possess the twisted means to terrorize the entire town. But did he? Then the unthinkable happened. Another child went missing. A young orphan girl, who often wandered the streets when she could not find a place to call home for the night, was heard screaming for his life. The townsfolk rushed to their windows, looking out, but not daring to leave the imagined safety of their houses, Jesus paralyzed Christ. by fear. The screaming ceased quickly. And moments later, wandering aimlessly out of the fog, came the menacing figure of Herbert Solomon. He rushed down the street, his lifeless arms bashing against the houses which he passed, scraping the doors and windows with his rigid fingers, all the while emitting an unnatural yell of anger and hatred on his way. Maybe he's pissed because you guys didn't help the poor kid. I don't know. Like, I don't know if I should be on Herbert's side or not. Like... On the one hand, he could be a child murderer. On the other hand, he might not. Like, there's nothing definitive yet. It's just these townsfolk thought it was him. They killed him, and now he's back. Like, part of me is like, well, if it was him, would he really haunt the town? Like, I mean, maybe he's pulling a William Afton, but also maybe he's just pissed because he got voted out like an Among Us and he wasn't the imposter, you know? Like, <laughs> I can understand that. And then all of them, like they said, all of them heard that kid screaming and all they did was look out their window. They didn't go out to help him. So, like, maybe, and then he started, like, getting angry and, like, hitting their doors and shit. Maybe he's like, hey, why don't you fuckheads do something instead of, like, just listening? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whose side I should be on right now. I'm kind of just, I'm staying neutral, but I don't know, man. The girl was gone, and the town grieved once more. In the proceeding days, the fog grew denser, and with it came the unwelcome news of two more children. One was a girl whom, after having a raging argument with her family, left the house never to be seen again. 
the other a boy named Matthew, the son of a notable drunk, who was taken from his own bed by the hands of Solomon while the father lay unconscious from drink. During a church service, the unthinkable happened. Solomon appeared briefly in the aisles of the church, seemingly Damn. unaffected by consecrated ground. The congregation whimpered in horror and disdain as his warped, spindly form walked slowly behind a pillar and then vanished. It was indeed a show of influence. Hope was almost lost. Well, if he's able to appear in a church, you know, a place of worship, a place that should, you know, be holy and like, you know, I don't know. I'm just imagining like demons, you know, they go to church and they start burning and stuff. Maybe that's like a, a sign that, hey, I'm actually good. You know, I was just kind of trying to be nice. Yeah, I was a little bit creepy, but like I didn't kill those kids, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Not even a place of worship could deny him, and he was now capable of entering any home at night and then taking whatever or whoever he wished. The town had to act or abandon the place altogether, but there was no guarantee that the curse of Solomon would not follow. The local vicar, a man by the name of Mackenzie, was asked by the people of Ettrick to use any sacred power which was ordained to him. In an attempt to destroy or banish the spirit of Solomon, a plan was provided. The vicar and a few chosen individuals, armed with torches, swords which had been blessed in vials of holy water, <clears throat> would take guard over the town, waiting for the cursed figure of that child killer to show his face once more. Then they would confront him. That night, the lonely figure of Herbert Solomon appeared through the mist, walking the streets of Ettrick with purpose. Yells and screams rang out as people alerted one another that Solomon had returned. And what happened? Families held their children close as dark thoughts consumed the town. Please spare my child. Take another's. Oh, uh, you dig? was the first to confront him. His will was shaken by the sight of Solomon's hideous, pallid face, rotten and ravaged. The gangly, spindling figure stood staring intently at the vicar's through black clouded eyes. Another man now joined, then another. Before long, Herbert Solomon was surrounded. Mackenzie instructed the men to slowly close the circle, drawing their swords with one hand while brandishing flaming torches with the other. Mackenzie threw a vial at Solomon's lumbering feet, and as he uttered a Christian psalm, another man struck out with his torch. The blow crackled as the cloth-covered arm of Solomon caught fire. Cheers rang out from the townsfolk watching from their homes above, but the man had stayed too close, providing a gap in the circle which Solomon claimed with purpose. He fled. Mm -hmm. His spindling legs and flailing arms cast spider-like shadows on the walls and cobbled streets as he passed. The townsfolk gave chase, following the pathetic figure as it negotiated each street, corner, lane, and courtyard in an attempt to escape their rage. The noise alerted the town. Herbert Solomon was trying to flee. From every home across the town, people poured out of their houses, carrying whatever they could fashion quickly into a makeshift weapon. They flooded the streets and ran towards the protestations, shouts, and screams of Solomon's pursuers. With every turn of a cobbled street corner, Solomon was running out of places to hide. Finally, as he stumbled down the town's main street, he stopped. The townsfolk had blocked all escape routes. He was trapped. Mackenzie pushed his way to the front of the crowd, asking for quiet and calm as he approached the hunched, defeated figure of Herbert Solomon. He just needs he to say something. I feel like there's going to be a twist. going to rid the town of Ettrick of this abomination once and for all. Vile in hand... Accompanied by several large, bullish men brandishing swords, Mackenzie approached, slowly reciting verses from the Bible, and then he simply turned and entered an open doorway next to him. The people gasped, and Mackenzie and his followers rushed inside after him. What is going the on? The house they had entered was still, and lying on the hard wooden floor of the main hallway was the pale body of a young girl. The creaking of floorboards under weight sounded above as numerous pursuers searched the house, disappointed to find nothing. 
then something miraculous occurred. The little girl gasped for air. She was alive. <laughs> she had little or no strength, and all she could do was utter one word. Below. In the cellar of the house, Mackenzie found a grim and horrific scene. The floor was covered in blood, and the quite dead body of a man lay face down upon it. Chained to the walls of that dim place were the children who had been taken. They were partially drugged, malnourished, and traumatized, but they were oh. alive. Oh, yay. The town rejoiced with the news. Families were reunited. Lives were So mended. it wasn't Herbert. The mist of a bleak and horrible winter slowly lifted, and all seemed well. On regaining their strength, the children recounted what had befallen them. Each of them had been taken by a man called Tom Sutherland. He was the father of the first girl who had went missing, and it appeared that it was he whom had killed her. No one knew for sure, but many were aware of his bad temper, and on more than one occasion he had beaten poor Alana. Consumed by guilt head. and loss, Sutherland began taking children at knife point and locking them in his cellar, often drugging them with a local herb and occasionally beating them while pathetically weeping in self-pity. Oh my God. On the day that the children were found, Sutherland entered the cellar drunk, carrying a knife and rope begun striking the children once more and told them that one would die that day. He untied one of the children and pinned her to the ground with his knees. His knife hovered over her neck, but just as he was about to plunge the blade into her neck, someone entered the house. Bro. Sutherland grew ferocious with anger, but whoever was standing at the top of the staircase struck such fear into him that he quickly backpedaled into the cellar. Ducking under the doorway was the tall, scarred figure of Herbert. Whoa! Summer. Herbert was the freaking Punisher this whole time. And y'all had the nerve to try to kill this man. Oh, you... Uh, no wonder he's so pissed. Like I said, because they didn't do shit. They just kept getting scared. Well, but uh, on the one hand, what were you doing in that old lady's bed? Like... Come on, Herbert. I get they tried to kill you, but that's a bit thats a bit of a creepo move. But still, I just knew, like, I just had a feeling that he wasn't the kidnapper. I didn't expect him to do a full 180 and turn out to be the freaking hero of this story. <laughs> Jesus. At the sight of him, and now being free, the little girl crawled quickly between Herbert's long legs. She was free, but too weak to run. She fainted before she could escape the house. Details of what happened to Tom Sutherland were muddled by the unstable, semi-conscious condition of the witnesses. But it was clear that his neck was broken, his head twisted with such force that it faced an unnatural opposite direction. Ah. There, he freaking got what is it? Max Mercury? Is that is that who Wonder Woman? Uh, is it? Oh, Maxwell Lord. There we go. DC Comics. Wonder Woman snapped his neck. His head was facing the other way. It was badass. There were various accounts of subsequent glimpses of Herbert Solomon, and some of the children claimed on occasion to find beautifully crafted dolls and toys set upon the ground near the edge of the woods. But, of course, this cannot be substantiated. Indeed, I would have said that the entire story could not be substantiated if it were not for the events which I experienced several months after reading that old book in the depths of St. Andrew's University. A colleague and dear friend of mine invited me to stay at his family home for a few days in the countryside. I knew that the house was in the borders, not a half-hour's drive from Ettrick, and could not miss the chance to have a closer look at the area. I had managed to persuade the powers to be to allow me to take the book from St. Andrew's and show it to my friend. He had a particular interest and not insignificant knowledge of the history of the area. I thought perhaps he could shine a light on this curious tale. His family were very kind to me, and the house and its grounds were serene in the summer sun, with his children playing in the fields, having a carefree and happy time. After reading the book, he told me that it was fascinating, and that he knew of a local poem which had been written in the 17th century about a man called Solomon who killed children but he could not tell me anything more. The next day, we heard screams coming from the nearby house. 
uh -huh. was my friend's little girl. We raced outside. Following the cries for help over an old fence and down a steep grassy hill, we reached a winding and furious river. The girl had fallen in and was clinging to a large tree root which thrust out from the opposite embankment on the water. Mm -hmm. The root was wet, and my friend let out a scream of anguish as his daughter lost her grip and was swept downstream towards a large formation of huge, sharp rocks which jutted out from beneath the surface. Well, if Herbert comes the river back. would not let go and was throwing around with such force that it was difficult to see how she could survive. Filled with the abject terror that she could be drowning, we finally made it to the water's edge. As we rushed into the murky torrent, we watched helplessly as the poor little girl was about to crash into the rocks. We were too far away. Suddenly, our attention was grabbed by the cracks and creaks of a tall, gaunt figure at the other side of the river, this rushing man's out of the woods at tremendous speed on the opposite bank. With one swift motion, a thin, bony hand plunged into the violent water, prevailing against the immense currents, finally pulling the young girl to safety. She was alive, frightened, crying, but alive and unhurt. The pale-faced, emaciated figure placed the girl gently Dude. on the ground, then stared at us through darkened eyes from across the river as we ourselves clambered to safety. Then it turned and disappeared into the woods, fading away to nothing but a memory. Even in death, Herbert Solomon was the kindest and gentlest of souls. Bro, all those village people owe this man an apology. Like, I, I didn't expect a freaking that kind of face turn for Herbert. Like, I thought maybe he was just going to be, oh, he was just some dude, actually. Like, he killed the wrong person, and now he's pissed. But no, he's just a superhero on his spare time. Like, apparently. Like, freaking saving children from psycho dads and just what... That was in the 1600s, and I'm guessing he was in modern times. And just 400 years later, he's still saving people. And then they say he had, like, a wasting disease. In the 1600s where you're lucky to like reach 40 you know like that's an old age at that time and he had a wasting disease so who knows but here's this man 400 years later still saving kids and stuff bro herbert solomon he got so done so dirty for no reason at all like i get it he was in that grandma's bed which that's a bit sus and he was giving kids dolls which you know is a little sus you know it's not like too sus but it's like hey it would warrant some questioning that's for sure but like man I, I was not expecting that at all let's get these lights back on it wasn't that scary but it was a great story that's for sure like that was amazing be sure to support the original creator chilling tales for dark nights uh yeah that was that that was a good creepy pasta that was a really good story but alrighty guys, thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Any feedback would be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay safe, everybody. Bye bye. I see you rolling up over black Cadillac, high heel boots, and a sexy body full of tats. Baby's bad, oh baby's hella bad. After her, there ain't no coming back. Wanna take a run at that? I think she's feeling me. Turn it up a few degrees. My imagination of her body gets the best of me. Oh God, she's such a tease. Bitten lips, bruised knees. I'm addicted to her, need her touching me. Cause she got a bad little waist, and we tearing down this place. Off the liquor that we chase. Got some amigos to the face, baby, I don't need no